Each year, the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day celebration in New Orleans includes a stop on the Rita Castle Haley Boulevard, where a commemorative statue was erected in 1976. Artist Frank Hayden, a former student at Xavier University and professor at Southern University, designed the abstract sculpture to honor Dr. King as a symbol of brotherhood and reconciliation. Inside the sculpture are excerpts from Dr. King's speeches. In January of 1957, looking to scale their success with Montgomery buses all across the South, as well as to move toward the full desegregation of public facilities, 60 black ministers and leaders, including Dr. King, would meet in Atlanta under the not short but quiet descriptive name, Southern Leadership Conference on Transportation and Nonviolent Integration. On Valentine's Day in 1957, Dr. King and 96 other black religious leaders of 35 communities from 10 states would meet in Central City. They would meet inside the New Zion Baptist Church on 3rd and LaSalle Streets. Their mission was to end segregation. During segregation in New Orleans, it was illegal for black and white patrons to dine in the same restaurant. But one still famous Treme restaurant, Dickie Chase, with a well-hidden staircase leading up to an inconspicuous second floor dining area, made it possible for leaders of the civil rights movement, regardless of race, to meet, eat, and plan together. In 1981, a second monument to Dr. King will be installed on the neutral ground of Claiborne Avenue as a memorial to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The life-size brown bus sits atop a granite pedestal. In April of 2019, local redevelopment officials, art experts, and business owners on a Rita Castle Haley Boulevard will celebrate the rededication of the neutral ground that will celebrate Dr. King. The newly refreshed neutral ground on Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard between Orito Casa Haley and South Rampart Street now features a walking path, benches, and landscaping, replacing the worn sidewalk and regularly grassy patches that formerly surrounded it. The $333,000 improvement on the neutral ground will be funded through the state's Office of Community Development and overseen by the New Orleans Redevelopment Authority. You are now about to witness the strength of street knowledge. For the New Jack City. Bum. Bum. It's shortly before 11 p.m. on a Sunday in the 1900 block of North Claiborne Avenue in the Seventh Ward. A 35-year-old male is lying lifeless in the street. The man had been hit up along with the 35-year-old male would be a 37-year-old female who had been hit up as well. The woman who was hit in the abdomen will be transported to the hospital where she will be taken into surgery. This is the story of Matnell Cantrell Allen, a.k.a. Face. Born to Esther Allen at McNelton Cooper in 1977, Matt Nell Cantrell Allen would come up in Uptown New Orleans, the Melphamine Project. Matt Nell Cantrell Allen will be one of a handful of brothers. Armando, Burnell A, Lester, Burnell T, Edgar, Dante, Rishi, and Will. Matt Nell would also have several sisters. Those sisters would be Chanel, Nikisha, Gwendolyn, Jessica, Katina, and Brandy. The Allen family will be large and garnered respect from the entire city, not just the MELF. Coming up in the grimy streets of the NO, the Allen boys were known for being about that life. The year is 1985. An incident would take place that would change McNeil's life forever. There will be many stories as to what actually transpired the summer of 85 that will forever impact McNeil's life as he would know it. One of those stories would be that an enraged woman would attempt to get back at her boyfriend by tossing a Molotov cocktail into her boyfriend's apartment window. She would ultimately hit the wrong window, igniting the flame that started the fire that would ultimately end up setting McNeil ablaze. Molotov cocktails are a hand-tossed weapon that consists of a glass bottle filled with a flammable liquid and infused when lit and thrown, shattering upon impact, igniting the flammable substance contained, spreading flames as the fuel burns. Another story being heard throughout the city is that it was never a woman. It, in fact, was a man. It is rumored that Matt Nell's mom would have an insecure and jealous boyfriend. Matt Nell's mom would part ways with dude, sending him into a jealous rage, triggering him to throw 
a grenade or Molotov cocktail into the window of her apartment. This would set the kitchen ablaze, causing a gas stove to blow, sending flames throughout the entire three-bedroom apartment. Matt Nell would narrowly survive the incident with severe burns over his entire body, initially earning him the nickname Nubby due to damage done to his hands from the fire. Burn masks are one of the most effective treatments that can be used to manage swelling and scarring from facial burns and skin grafts. These masks are made from the same tight elastic fabric as compression garments. Burn masks work by ensuring that the mask is compressing the burned skin as effectively as possible, making for a more successful and speedy recovery. It is this type of mask that Manel would wear until his burns were healed enough to no longer need it. The mask had nothing to do with McNeil being uncomfortable and afraid to show his face as other videos on the platform have falsely stated. After doctors will remove the mask, McNeil will now go by what he would be infamously known as today, Face. Face, who was strong-willed, would stand on what he believed in, defining right from wrong based on what he felt and not that of what others would like him to believe. Contrary to popular belief, Face was a ladies' man. Face would have a dealing with some of the baddest broads in the city. No stranger to the streets, Face was about that life. Although his fingers had been burned down to the nubs, Face was still squeezed. It is rumored that Face would use popsicle stick and string to pull the trigger, making him a force to be reckoned with in the streets. Not only about that trigger play, Face wouldn't back down from throwing them hands and would be quick to scuffle. Face would build a reputation for being a known stepper. The whole city knew that Face wasn't to be played with. Face would ultimately end up losing his life to the streets on September 30th of 2012. This was the story of McNeil Cantrell Allen, aka Face Out the Melf. The time is 10.30 p.m. The date, February 8th, 2004. The location is 2339 Martin Luther King Boulevard in New Orleans, Louisiana. Detectives will find one body at the bottom of a stairway leading down to the courtyard of the Melphamine Project. Another body will be found on the stairway leading to the second floor. The stairways and landings were on the outside of the building. The crushing appeared to have occurred in the courtyard or on the first floor. One man appeared to have been hit up downstairs and climbed the stairs to the second floor before collapsing. Detectives were interviewed an alleged witness. The alleged witness would tell detectives that earlier that day, he had received a call from his son asking him for a ride from 2339 Martin Luther King Boulevard. Upon arriving at the location, the alleged witness would go to look for his son where he knew he hung out. Once making it to the second floor landing, he would observe his son, who had been hit up, laying on the ground. He would then call the NOPD. This is the story of Romando Flair Allen, brother of Face. The city of New Orleans is divided into 17 wards. Politically, the wards are used in voting and election. Subdivided into precincts, the various city charters of the 19th century, aldermen and later city council members were elected by ward. The city has not had officials elected to represent wards since 1912, but the ward designations remain a part of New Orleans fabric. The 8th Ward is a narrow strip stretching from the Mississippi River on the south to Lake Hunter Train in the north. East or down is the 9th Ward, the boundary being Franklin Avenue, Almanasta Avenue, then Peoples Avenue, and a line straight north into the lake at part of the University of New Orleans campus. On the west or upper side, the boundary is Elysian Fields, the boundary with the 7th Ward of New Orleans. As with most of New Orleans, the area along natural high ground of the riverfront was developed for urban use first. Other than the narrow high ground of Gentilly Ridge, the majority of the area between Claiborne Avenue and the lake was underdeveloped until improved drainage 
was initiated at the start of the 20th century. In the 19th century, in the area from Gentilly Ridge to the lake, the People's Avenue Canal formerly stretched along the ward's back boundary with the lower line Hunter train levee in the back, making it the city limit of New Orleans. Twelve men that were accused of being members of a clique from the 8th Ward called Ride or Die were set to be arraigned on Tuesday, September 24, 2013 in federal court. A federal grand jury would hand up the indictment on a Thursday. It would be unsealed that Friday. According to the 20-count indictment, the clique carried four crushings to further its enterprise. The clique slung that girl, green, and that boy in this territory. The indictment would identify that territory as being bounded by North Miro Street, St. Cloud Avenue, Elijah Fields Avenue, and Franklin Avenue. Also known as ROD, it is alleged that the clique sought retribution on anyone who showed them or the enterprise any disrespect. They were known for displaying a reckless disregard for life itself. This is the story of the Lloyd Puggy Jones. Alleged members of the clique are as follows. Eloy Puggy Jones, 21. Byron Big Baby Jones, 23. Sydney Duda Man Patterson, 22. Irvin Nurky Spooner, 25. Romalis Roro Parker, 20. Nyson Nicey Jones, 29. Trey Clemens, 22. Andrelli Newt Lewis, 34. Morris Summers, 22. Tyrone Burton, aka Peanut, 20. Tyron Madman Burton, 19. And Perry. Yummy Wilson, 22. The indictment is the latest result of work by the MAG unit, which is led by the NOPD. The unit's investigations have led to sprawling racketeering indictments for other cliques, including the Seven World Clique, MMG, the One Tenors, Green G, and the Taliban. Prosecutors will seek higher sentences by invoking the RICO Act, aimed at habitual criminals by letting the jury see a pattern of behavior as opposed to isolated incidents. Defense attorneys would say that prosecutors are only trying to bolster cases that were weak and wouldn't stand up without invoking a RICO. They would also complain that the large number of defendants for one case is too burdensome on court systems that are already under intense strain, especially for public defenders. According to the 33-page indictment, the clique leader, Deloitte Puggy Jones, crushed 17-year-old Rodney Coleman on November 9th of 2010 and 22-year-old Devin Hutton on January 17, 2011. Deloitte Puggy Jones and Sidney Patterson are charged with crushing 19-year-old Corey Blue on January 18th of 2011. Byron Jones and Sidney Patterson were crushed 30-year-old Travis Arnold on February 24th, 2010. ROD would boast about their acts, taking pictures and videos of themselves with straps. Deloitte Puggy Jones, who had been in prison serving an 80-year sentence since March 2012, was convicted by a jury in December of 2011, along with Alton Pee Wee Augustine on two counts each of attempted crushings. Prosecutors will claim that they started busing in the 1300 block of Gallier Street, which is home to two alleged members of the G-Strip. This would leave two people injured, including a 78-year-old woman who would be sitting in her kitchen nearby. Delar Jones, aka Puggy, would twice be the city's most wanted man. After spending years in and out of the criminal system, Puggy would be indicted by the Fed. Puggy would be accused of being a part of a criminal enterprise known as Ride or Die. On the street, they were pumping on operating mainly in the Gentilly area. Puggy would be 15 when he would break out of the youth study center. Facing charges, he was considered armed and dangerous. A few months after Puggy turned 17, he would be booked as an adult for busing his gap. NOPD would allege that Puggy popped up a dude on North Roman in 2009. Later that same day, Puggy and another man would get caught up trying to jack a bay car. The bay car would stall, the doors would auto lock, by remote control. The NOPD was swoop in. Puggy would eventually be arrested and plead guilty. He would be sentenced to five years suspended sentence, meaning he served no jail time. Just days after being released on a spree in the Ninth Ward, Puggy would allegedly be running through the hood trying to knock off a dude. Puggy would be cowboying, missing his op, hitting occupied home. The DA would refuse the charges. It was rumored that the age of 18 
puppet would pull off an act on Spain Street. A few days later, he would smash someone. In February of 2011, a chase and massive manhunt would lead to Bucky's arrest. A 20-count federal indictment would accuse Bucky of RICO violation. A federal jury would return a guilty verdict against Ryder Die that prosecutors would accuse of illegal activity. Deloy Jones, aka Puggy, 23, Byron Jones, 24, and Sidney Patterson, 24, we were convicted on numerous counts of RICO violations. The prosecution would allege that they were responsible for going hard in the St. Rock community. The three men would be named in the 2013 federal racketeering indictment. Eight other men would plead guilty. A ninth man would agree to a plea deal in 2014. The loyal Puggy Jones was convicted of 11 of 13 counts. Byron Big Baby Jones was convicted of nine of nine counts. Sidney Dudeman Patterson was convicted of 11 counts, including conspiracy to violate RICO. All three men would face life in prison. As we approach the 10th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina, police and prosecutors in the city of New Orleans announced the indictment and convictions of two different the city of New Orleans. We've all heard about the ride or die, big lot of arrests in the last couple of years. Today, numerous convictions. Three of those members were convicted, nine others pled guilty. The U.S. attorney and police chief say this is a step in the right direction to keeping the city of New Orleans safe. Also, they indicted numerous members of another known as the YMM. The police chief tells us, like I said, this makes New Orleans safe. What you are witnessing is one team, one fight. There is no light between us. We can't be stopped. We can't even be slowed down. The U.S. attorney for this area, Kenneth Polite, has put an emphasis on cracking down on violence, especially in the streets of New Orleans. Hear what he has to say about this situation coming up at 5 o'clock. For now, reporting on your side in New Orleans, I'm Travers Mackle, WDSU News. But now we're about to witness the strength of street knowledge. For the New Jack City. Bum. The Sanders family, one of the largest and most respected families to ever run the streets of New Orleans, with names such as Foo, Charlie, Javel, Jeff, Stepper, and Trenise, a.k.a. Nisi. The Sanders bloodline ran deep. The younger generation of Sanders will produce one of the most notorious street figures in the city of New Orleans, Jarnell Jern Sanders. With the game soaked up from OGs and his family and other made men like OG Jert, Jern will earn his stripes and the whole city would know that he wasn't to be played with. Not to be confused with DBs, another group of young hitters out of Noya, Jarnell was a one-man army. Hailing from the TC on the old side, Jarnell wouldn't hesitate to put in work. It is rumored that Jern and Stupid would once get into it. By his early teens, Jern would be recognized as a certified headbuster. Just like the OGs from his family tree that came before him, Jarnell would be heavy in the streets. Jern would make it his business to hold down the old side of the Noya at all costs. The old side was more laid back, but don't get it twisted. Them boys was about that action. Known for being more grimy and cutthroat, the new side would have a wilder reputation. It's no secret that if you got caught slipping on the old side, you would get your issue. Christopher Dorsey, aka BG, would mention Jarnell's name on C Murders. You heard of me. Being feared in the streets is the gift and the curse. When you have a reputation for busting heads and not playing, the streets not going to play with you. They will come at you like you would come at them. As was the case with Janelle Sanders, AKA Jern. On or about August 21st, 2008, Janelle and his girl Candace would arrive at Tim's Body Shop located on La Harp Street in the Seven Ward. April 21st, 2008 will be the last time Jarnell and his girl Candace will be known to be alive. On April 25th, they will be reported missing. NOPD will receive a call regarding a torch rental car sitting on the side of I-10. Candace had rented the car a few weeks prior. 
the NOPD would have the car towed back to the rental car service. A foul odor would be noticed. Inside the car would be the bodies of both Jarnell and Candace. Both bodies had been and dismembered and were badly burned. The crime would be a cold case for nearly a decade. It's been almost nine years since Katrina Gillard McGuire saw her oldest daughter, Candace Gillard, alive. You know, it's not a day go by that I don't think about Candace, and it's just the way that she is hard to put closure to that. Candace went missing on April 21st, 2008. She was going on a date with her boyfriend, Jarnell Sanders, that night, but the pair was never heard from again. About a week after their disappearance, their bodies were discovered inside of a burned SUV in New Orleans East. The vehicle abandoned near Mishu and I-10. I wouldn't wish that on nobody's child. I don't care what type of life they live. You know, it's just, it wasn't fair. It wasn't fair to her. She was only 24, you know, and her life was cut short for stupidity. No one. No one has the authority to take somebody else's life. A frustrated New Orleans detective, Winston Harbin, says he knows of several people who have information pertaining to this case. He believes Sanders had a conflict with someone about a vehicle and is pointing to a failed deal as a possible motive. I would encourage those who know for their own well-being and, and, and peace of mind to please contact me and give me the information, give me the information I need to further this case for the mother of this girl and the parents and mother of this son. Katrina is now living in Shreveport after February's tornado ripped through her New Orleans East neighborhood. She's thankful for the photos and memories she still has of her daughter, but still questions why someone would want to hurt this young mother and business school student who was aspiring to give her daughter a better life. How could you live with yourself knowing that, you know, you took somebody's life and then you took somebody you know, an innocent person. Reporting, I'm Randy Russo, WDSU News. Timothy Webb would be indicted in 2017 on two counts of secondary for taking the lives of Janelle and Candace. Prosecutors would amend Timothy Webb's indictment, charging him with two counts of obstruction of justice investigation. Timothy would also plead guilty to felony death and would be sentenced to 10 years in prison for the crime. Chuck Woody, Afamata, Timothy's co-defendant will be charged with two counts of second degree and firing the shots that Jarnell and Candace. He would also be awaiting trial on federal charges for slaying armored truck guard Hector Torches in 2013. Timothy Webb, who had been running a chop shop mass as an auto repair business, named Tim's Auto with dismantled stolen cars and sell the parts. Jarnell kicked Tim off Tim Racks for the Corvette that had been in Tim's shops for weeks. Tim, who was given Jernk the runaround, had pissed Jarnell off. It is alleged that Jernk had Candace call the shop and check on his whip. Tim would talk crazy to Candace over the phone. This would send Jarnell into beast mode, who would demand both his car and his money back immediately. Timothy, who knew that Jernk was out his top, was spooking off of Jarnell and would call Chuck Woody, Chuck Afamada, to take that pressure. It wouldn't be long before Janelle would show up to the shop and confront Tim, Chuck, and another man, Alan Lewis. Janelle and Candace would pull up to the chop shop after the heated phone argument. It was alleged that Janelle hopped out of the whip with the blicky, demanding his bread back from Tim while the men were in the shop arguing. Chuck would then hit Janelle once and walk over him to delete him. The most cowardly act would take place next as Chuck will walk outside the shop and fire several rounds through the windshield of the SUV, taking Candace's life. Chuck would move Candace from the driver's seat and drive the car into the shop. Both bodies will be dismembered and driven to New Orleans East. where the vehicle will be set on fire. The men will get rid of all evidence by cleaning up the blood and casings from the shop. Tim, followed by Alan Lewis, will drive the Corvette to an unclosed spot in Metairie. Chuck, Afamara is a real piece of shit, as this wouldn't be the only charges that he would be facing. He would also be faced with federal trafficking charges of a minor.
On Tuesday, February the 14th, 2023, Timothy Webb pleaded guilty to two counts of obstruction of justice in connection with taking the lives of Janelle and Candace in 2008. Chuck, who had ducked the cops, will plead not guilty to the charges involving Janelle and Candace. The Melfamine Projects, officially called the Gustavo Apartments or the Gus Homes, is a housing complex located in the Central City neighborhood of New Orleans. The Melf, constructed in 1964, occupies 10 city blocks, founded by South Robinson, Clio, Simon Boulevard, and Martin Luther King. There will be four three-story buildings and two four-story buildings for families and a high-rise for the elderly. Being 12 stories tall, the Gus High Rise is the tallest public housing complex in the city. The MELF, once made up of single multi-family homes, by the 1950s, the city declared the MELF as the slums, which paved the way for the build of the projects. The MELF will be the youngest surviving housing projects in New Orleans. The high rise will undergo major renovations in 2002. In the 1980s and the 1990s, the MELF was well known for that work as it was once run over by steppers and hustlers. In 2004, three of six low rise buildings will be demolished after failing to meet the Housing Authority of New Orleans economic guidelines. In 2006, the MELF will be one of the only projects in the city that survived Hurricane Katrina with minimal wind damage and no flooding. The last building will be demolished in 2013. Reconstruction will begin in the same year at a cost of $61 million through the use of $26 million from Hano, $21.3 million from FEMA, and $13.1 million in low-income housing credits. Gibbs Construction and Clomax Construction will complete the development of the new one, two, three, and four bedroom unit, which include energy star appliances, which would also be pre-wired for cable and internet services. The new Gus Homes would open in 2018 with 638 homes located on the entire Gus site, 577 of which are public housing units. The story starts in the MELF, former home to matriarch Miss Meliza, mother of Brenda and Michelle Keelan, aka Missy, off the MLK side of the MELF. Passion Cobbins will grow up in the MELF with the men who she would take the stand on in 2017. Coined as the First Lady, Passion will spill on the men who we now know today as YMM. Passion will go on to testify that the men move work and crush their ops. Claiming to have witnessed one crushing and having extensive knowledge of four more, Passions will go on to testify that YMM would brag about spending the bin. Passion, who dropped out in 11th grade, did hair in the project and would be on the set with YMM. 25 at the time of the trial, Passion will give full details on the crushing of Deshaun Hartford. Passion would allege that Lionel Allen, aka Lot, will pull out two blicks, push her to the ground, and smash the Sean Hartford. Passion, who was arrested herself on unrelated aggravated assault charges in July of 2014, wouldn't be done. She will go on to testify that in 2012, Titty would delete Vinnie Smith, aka Funk. YMM would believe that Funk was playing both sides of the field with the one tenors. Passion would state that during the reign of YMM, she and her former boyfriend, Jacoby Boyd, aka Co of YMM, who was sentenced to 40 years for crushing Travis Thomas on I-10, were like Bonnie and Clyde. The Rick, Jawan, Brian, and Delwin would all be convicted following a seven-day trial. Lionel Allen, a.k.a. Lott, would be tagged with the leader role of YMM. YMM was allegedly formed in or about 2005 and will continue to exist through 2014. It was rumored that YMM controlled the Central City Territory up and down Martin Luther King by the mouth. YMM would allegedly participate in a wide range conspiracy to pump that hard in Central City. A long-standing feud between the one tenors and YMM would be in place. Coming up in the mouth, 
members of the Allen family and YMM would have blood and street ties. Three members of the one tenors will be convicted on January 29th of 2015 in Orleans Parish from the court for the Brianna Allen occurrence. Absolutely, Camille. And as you can understand, this is a moment the families of Brianna Allen and Shawana Pierce have been waiting for since that May 29, 2012, when the suspects were accused of opening fire with an AK-47. Well, now the jury has spoken. All three convicted on charges. Now, this is a trial that has stretched on for just about three weeks now. Uh, the prosecutors allege that not only did the, sus the convicted people in this case open fire, Allen and Shawana Pierce, the prosecutors also say that they were involved in an uptown gang that funneled and weapons throughout the city. That's why they also faced a racketeering charge. They were found guilty on that as well. Guilty on all counts in the indictment except for one of the lesser charges. Now, this was an emotional time for the family. In the courtroom, you could see tears streaming down the faces. You can see people hunched over, sobbing, wondering if this is a day that would ever come. One of the suspects, Sam Newman, actually jumped up and started to shout out while the verdict was being read he wanted to be taken out of the courtroom the court was then uh, resumed to order as they continued to read the verdict certainly we're waiting on family and attorneys to come out of the courtroom we'll bring you details as we get them but for now we're on your side at criminal court i'm dina swanson back to you Lot will be found guilty of conspiracy to possess tools during and in relation to other related crimes pushing that work assault with a weapon and deleting three of his ops it will be the testimony of passion that will seal Lot's fate for allegedly participating in the smashing of Benny Smith on April 22nd, 2012, the crushing of Deshaun Hoffer on June 3rd, 2012, and for being an aider and a better in the deletion of Travis Thomas that occurred in May of 2013. Lionel Allen, a.k.a. Lott, will be one of 11 men originally charged in August of 2014 in a superseding indictment involving weapons and pumping that work. Five members of YMM will plead guilty to the conspiracy charges and will be sentenced. Jacoby Cole Boyd was sentenced to 480 months of incarceration. Alfred L. Cobbins was sentenced to 252 months of incarceration. Sean Gunner Grayson was sentenced to 207 months of incarceration. Ruben Rue Geiger was sentenced to 220 months of incarceration. Darius D. Man Williams was sentenced to 156 months of incarceration. And DeAndre Soldier Hills was sentenced to 96 months of incarceration. In August of 2015, federal RICO charges for crushing the ops will be added against the remaining alleged members of YMM in a second superseding indictment. Wilson will plead guilty and was sentenced to 180 months of incarceration. Keelan will be sentenced to life plus 10 years after being convicted of multiple counts of deleting his ops. Titty will be sentenced to life in prison for his participation in the RICO. Delwood will be sentenced to 16 years of incarceration for his participation in the same conspiracy. Brian Scott will receive 20 years years in prison for his role in the conspiracy. On Wednesday, December the 13th, Lionel Allen, a.k.a. Lott, will become the last of a group of five YMM members to be sentenced following being convicted. In June, Lott's co-defendants, Titty, Roy, Pooh Stupid, and Brian Scott, had been sentenced earlier that fall. Lott was convicted of 21 of the 24 counts against him, he would receive the harshest punishment of the five men. Lionel Allen, a.k.a. Lott's convictions were racketeering, three counts of crushing his ops in the aid of racketeering. The victims would be Deshaun Hartford, Benny Smith, and Travis Thomas. Six counts of assault with a weapon in the aid of racketeering, eight counts of discharging a weapon in relation to a crime, moving that work, and conspiracy to possess the Blickies. Smith and Hawford, who had been deleted in April and June of 2012, as well as Thomas, who had been crushed in May of 2013, would all be on Lott's charges. Lott would also be accused of spinning the bin 12 different times between October 2011 and May 
2013. Acting U.S. Attorney Dwayne E. Evans would announce that Lionel Allen, a.k.a. Lott, would be sentenced after having previously been found guilty of violating the Racketeer Influence Corrupt Organizations Act, a.k.a. RICO. U.S. District Judge Kurt D. Englehart was sentenced Lott to serve life in prison plus 420 months, which is 35 years, to run consecutive. Welcome to New Orleans, home of Mardi Gras Indians, Second Line Clubs, historically famous bars, clubs, and hotels, such as the Dew Drop Inn, the Sandpiper, Madison Hotel on MLK, and the Forest Inn, located on LaSalle and 7th. The city where the residents say things such as, run my bath water, I need to make groceries, ham bra, you heard me, and what's happening, baby? Notoriously known for being the city that never sleeps and birthing some of the most gangster hitters the states have ever seen. The young Gregory Stewart was raised in the Upper Ninth Ward of New Orleans. The Lower Ninth Ward being anything across the Industrial Canal, the Upper being anything before crossing the canal. Gregory would grow up on Gallagher, notoriously known as the G-Strip, located on Gallagher and Urquhart, off of Murray. During his adolescent years, Gregory would attend Lorraine Hainsbury, a.k.a. Palmer, and Charles Richard Drew Elementaries. Gregory would attend Colton Middle in his preteen years. Before Katrina would strike New Orleans, Gregory would attend St. James Major High School. Post-Katrina, he would spend a short time at Bonneville High, from which he would later attend Nichols, a.k.a. Douglas High School. Gregory would eventually end up dropping out when one of his partners got hit up. The streets beef had gotten too serious. Knowing the seriousness of the beef, Gregory would always be strapped. Late one night while hanging out on the G-Strip, Gregory would be stopped and frisked by the NOPD. A scuffle would ensue. The cops would slam Gregory to the ground. Gregory, who was strapped at the time, would pretend to be knocked out. As the cops would get closer, Gregory would spring up and dash, earning him the nickname Rabbit, which was given to him by Lewis Daniels. Needing money for clothes and shoes at the age of 11 is when Gregory would try his hand at sellers. Petty hustling, slinging $2 rocks and bags of In the mean streets of New Orleans, this would be normal for kids coming up in the hood. Another hustle that Gregory would partake in will be tap dancing on Bourbon Street in the quarters. Like most teens in the hood, Rabbit would learn to drive at an early age. Hanging around the OGs in the hood, this would come easy. 2006 would be the year that Rabbit would get involved with the 11-5 trade. Lloyd Curry, aka Slugger, and Daryl Franklin, aka Breezy, were partners at the time. Realizing that Rabbit was a young dude who had heart, the pair would take a liking to Gregory and provide him with that boy. Coming up, Rabbit was small in stature with a childlike appearance. Slugger and Breezy would take advantage of this. Rabbit would take the Greyhound bus back and forth to Texas to cop the work. Being 14 or 15 at the time, the cops would never expect Rabbit of transporting that dog food. Having a rough upbringing, Rabbit would witness his first body at the age of 3 or 4. He would witness his mother's boyfriend pass in his grandmother's living room. While in the fifth or sixth grade, one of Rabbit's friends would be accidentally deleted. This would not traumatize the young Gregory as he had become numb to violence at a young age. Rabbit and Louis Daniel, aka Lou, would have a brotherly like relationship. Lou, who was a known, would put Rabbit down on the game. Don't aim for the head, aim for the body. When they fall, walk over them and crush them. Lloyd Curry, a.k.a. Slugger, was also a known, also put Rabbit on game. The first that Rabbit would be involved with would come late one night in 2007. After leaving the club, Rabbit and his homies would be chilling on the G-Strip. Calvin Brumfield would creep down on them and hit one of Rabbit partners up nine times. Once his clip was empty, he would flee. Rabbit and his partner would give chase and run him down, catching him as he was attempting to hop a fence to the getaway car. Calvin would be pulled down from the fence, stomped, and choked out. Tyson Bell would return to the scene after leaving to get the 
Blicky. Tyson would then hit Kelvin in the head with a 38 caliber, crushing him. Lloyd Curry, a.k.a. Slugger, who was deep in the streets at the time, would catch a jose. While incarcerated, Slugger and Breezy would fall out. Breezy refused to Joe Slugger and left him hanging. Already having a bad taste in his mouth for Merle upon his release, Slugger will vow vengeance on Breezy and Merle. Rabbit, who will be locked up for a short stint, will be released in March of 2009. Lou will be picked up for crushing a dude out to Florida on G-Strip. The only witness will be the victim's mother. Breezy was supposed to take care of the witness, but didn't. This would infuriate Lou, who would beat the charge and upon his release would swear to crush Breezy. Rabbit, who had a month left on his bed at the time, would be caught in the middle between Slugger, Lou, Breezy, and Merle. Gregory Stewart, aka Rabbit, will remain neutral, stating as long as none of the G-Strip dudes got crushed, he would stay out of it. Breezy would introduce Rabbit to Merle. Breezy and Merle would convince Rabbit to join them by giving him 10 racks and a brick of 11.5. Rabbit would give out samples of that foil and tell Vicks to cop from the G-Strip. This would get the G-Strip pumping. Hearing that Rabbit was getting money on the G-Strip, the dudes out the Florida, like Evans and his homies, would join Rabbit on the strip. Pound, who was in juvenile jail with Rabbit, would also hit the strip. This would incite envy and jealousy. Still heated about the entire situation, Lou would call Rabbit, telling him that he was on his way to crush someone on the G-Strip. Before Rabbit could fully warn, Lou and Cole would pull up and hit four of them up. Breezy's sister would be Cole's next victim. Before Cole could squeeze, Rabbit would push her down to the ground. Lou would hop back in the whip and mash out. This would infuriate Rabbit, who would now be part of the war. The year is 2010, five years after Hurricane Katrina. The war between 3 and G and the Yo is at its peak. Merrill O'Frey, a.k.a. Black, and his partner in crime, Darrell Franklin, a.k.a. Breezy, were putting a stronghold on the 11-5 trade in the city. The only ops standing in their way would be from the Desire and the Calio housing projects. April 12th, 2010, it would get real out here in these streets. Breezy and his crew were posted up on Desire by the Wing Shack. One of them will spot known stepper, Lloyd Curry, a.k.a. Slugger. Breezy and Slugger were cool before Slugger got locked up. It is rumored that Breezy went under on Slugger with a half a bird while Slugger was Josie. The relationship would never be the same. Spotting Slugger would put everyone on alert. It wouldn't be long before shots would ring out. Everyone was scattered. Breezy would leap from a porch and roll under a house. When the smoke cleared, Terrence Butler, a.k.a. Cheddar Black, and Derek Jones, a.k.a. Gucci Man, had both been crushed. Merle, Breezy, and Gregory Rabbit Stewart would jump in Merle's Audi and give chase. They would catch up with Quentin Gutter Broussard on Cluer Street and crush him. It has been a violent night across Southeast Louisiana. New this morning, we are tracking two separators breaking out just hours apart. The latest one took place near the St. Claude neighborhood on Cluett Street near North Galvez. Elton Fields, a.k.a. Bo, and Corey Lewis, a.k.a. Cole, would both jump a fence and get away. Slugger would spin the bin once again to catch Jesse, Terry, a.k.a. G-Strip Baby, stepping on Amanaster and delete him. This day of events would leave three fallen members of the 39ers. Breezy and Rabbit would be devastated by this loss and will vow to get revenge. A few short weeks after the massacre, Rabbit and T-Red would unload AK-47 into Bo's whip, believing they had caught him slipping. No Daniels, a.k.a. Dizzy, would be crushed in the process, who was merely using Bo's whip. Taking no mercy, Jasmine Perry, aka J. Real, 
Ashton Price, a.k.a. Pound, along with Evans Lewis, a.k.a. Easy, were crushed Anthony Brown, believing that he stole a handgun that they would eventually find. The summer of that same year, Merrill would throw a lavish retirement party at the Sports View, a local sports bar located in the 8th Ward of New Orleans, up, down, and downtown with a 10. Nut the Kid would even show up to the huge event. In October of that same year, Merrill and Breezy would drop Bo's location. Rabbit and T-Red would pull up and crush him in the 7th Ward. Late January 2011, Calvin Celestine, a.k.a. Plucky, would be deleted. Rabbit would be the trigger man. It was rumored that Plucky was playing both ends against the middle, triggering the hit to be placed on him. Mo, another rival of the crew, would still be alive. Merle and Breezy would get the green light from Lil to pump on 3 and G. The first to be fronted would be McCoy Walker, a.k.a. Rat Trap. It wouldn't be long before everyone on the set was pumping, birthing the 39ers. In April of 2011, Rabbit, A.D., and Big Wash would plot on the Calio, wielding a 223 A.D. with open fire, per Rabbit's instruction, hitting Floyd Moore. Rabbit would then stand over Floyd and finish the job. The retaliation for G-Baby, Money's brother, would be a reckless... Before the events took place, it was already made up in Rabbit's mind to crush anyone that they see on the porch in the Calio. Wash, being a driver, would drive Breezy's Infinity in the Calio to do the shooting. Ronnell Oni, who had nothing to do with it, would later be charged with the crime. I think that there's no value right now for life. WDSU sources confirmed tonight that one of the victims of a double broad daylight earlier today was indeed a popular local rapper. Fans are turning to the internet to mourn the loss of the second female rapper to sign on with Cash Money Records, a national label that began here in the Crescent City. 28-year-old Renetta Lowe, better known to her fans as Magnolia Shorty, was down yesterday along with another man. And today, thousands of people are commenting on a Facebook page dedicated to the rapper WDSU news reporter Sydney Chuan is live with the latest on the search for the Sydney. Latanya, unfortunately, New Orleans police do not have any information regarding any suspects or motive in this case. But you mentioned Magnolia Shorty was yesterday. Her friend was 25-year-old Jerome Hampton, both of them in New Orleans East in the 6300 block of Bridgehampton Drive in the Georgetown apartment complex. In December of 2010, five days before Christmas, furious with Jerome Man Man Hampton for an act that he pulled off in 2005, the 39ers would devise a plan to finish Man Man once and for all. Casing out the Calio all day with no luck at spotting Man Man, Rabbit would suggest driving to the East. T-Red's girl lived in the same apartments with Shardy, and she had spotted Man Man hanging out there. She would pass this on to T-Red, who would pass this on to Rabbit. Car full of men stacked with fully automatic handguns and assault rifles would head to the Georgetown apartment complex in the New Orleans East. Deciding to wait Man Man out, the crew would pull out of the complex to cop cigars. Not wanting to be spotted, they would send a junkie into the store to snatch the guards for them. Re-entering the complex, T-Red would use his girl's passcode for the security gate. It is then they would spot Renetta Lowe and Jerome Hamptons inside the white Malibu. The team of men would open fire, striking Shardy instantly. A hair would ensue, crushing both Man Man and Shardy. Gregory Rabbit Stewart would later be arrested in June of 2011 in an Atlanta hotel while trying to disguise himself wearing a roster wig. It wouldn't be long before Rabbit would cooperate with the government, giving up his partners.
question tonight about the man police said was the intended target of Saturday's match. Jeremiah Lee was connected to a New Orleans... Lee's rap sheet shows a conviction for possession in municipal court in 2009, but three subsequent felony cases were still pending when Lee was Ow. an admitted Ow. member of the sprawling 3NG named for their connection to the neighborhood around 3rd and Galvez. Lee was scheduled to appear in court on August 15th in each of those three open cases, but whoever was gunning for him made sure he would not be around to answer to the charges. Jamal Smith, a.k.a. Maul, a.k.a. Sickle, born in 1988, was raised in Uptown, New Orleans. Maul was a beast out here in these streets, beefing with the Magnolia, the Fisher, and Gertown. His most notorious beef would be with 3NG. This rivalry dates back as far as June 2006, when Arsenal and Markey, the brothers of Narky Hunter, were crushed in what we now know today as the Central City Massacre. It is alleged that Maul would crush AP off of 3NG, adding fuel to the flames that were already lit. In 2007, Arthur Dow, the older brother of Kareem Dow and Emmett Allen, will be deleted on 2nd and South Miro, allegedly at the hands of 3NG. It is alleged that in 2011, Narke Hunter, Terrius T. Red Oni, Tyrone T-Bone Knockham, and Charles Anderson would spin the bin on Emmett Allen, injuring him and taking the life of young Kiara Holmes. Emmett would be crept down on by two whips. Fire will erupt in the 3300 block of Erato. The cars would speed off, leaving both victims. Tyrone Knockham would later be charged with the crime. We're here tonight because little Kira Holmes' life was taken senselessly two days ago on Erato Street at around 5 o'clock in the afternoon. In that scene, 19-year-old Emmett Allen was severely wounded and he's still listed in critical condition. I can tell you now that 23-year-old Narkey Hunter, who we believe is one of the open fired on Erato Street Sunday, is in the custody of the NOPD and has been so since earlier today. Hunter was picked up by members of the U.S. Marshals Task Force this morning on a, at a house on Wright Avenue in Terrytown. I can also tell you now that 26-year-old Charles Anderson, who was killed yesterday in the 2300 block of North Robinson, is believed to have been another person of interest in the, on Sunday. It wouldn't be long after the Cali fire that Charles Anderson would be found deleted inside of a home in the St. Rock 8 Ward neighborhood of New Orleans. Very frightening situation that I'm getting very tired of. In New Orleans. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Cherie Skipson. And I'm Katie Moore. It happened in the St. Rock neighborhood. Paralyzed by crime. That's how people living in the St. Rock community say they feel about their neighborhood. We're following two breaking news stories this morning. The first is in New Orleans. One man is in the hospital after and the St. Rock neighborhood. It's also investigating a separate place just hours earlier. And OPD says this incident happened in the St. Rock area. Rock neighborhood police said someone another man at 605. We're following some breaking news. A man after being shot in the St. Rock area. With the game soaked up from his big homies on failure, Mo by this time had earned his stripes and the whole city knew that he wasn't to be played with. In August of 2012, Kareem Dow would be hit up 20 times, losing his left leg. He would now be wheelchair bound. This would not be the last time that Kareem would be hit up. In 2016, he would be hit up three different times. The beef had spiraled out of control. Maul was staying tall in the paint, putting in work, and would seem untouchable. Arno Learson and Nathan McCray, known 3NG affiliates, will be the next targets. In September of 2016, they will be caught slipping on First and Claiborne. This unfortunately would take the life of Ernest McKnight, an innocent bystander. Ernest McKnight was an innocent bystander who was cut down by fire. But what about the intended targets? We have new details about their suspected ties to a notorious... Paul Murphy joins us now with that story, Paul. Karen, Tom, police now want to know if Sunday is part of a resurgence in related violence in the city. While the NOPD searches for suspects in the case, friends of the victim are mourning his loss.
The 63-year-old man in Sunday's match near First in Claiborne was a hard-working landscaper and well-liked neighbor on Rex Place in Central City. The woman next door said he loved to work in the garden in front of his house. We would have a conversation every morning. He'd ask me how I was doing, doing different things. He helped me to cut some of the grass across the street. Ernest McKnight had just walked down the street to buy a pack of cigarettes at the corner grocery store, which rang out him in the head, and he lay later University Medical Center. McKnight's other next door neighbor said, unfortunately, he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. I had heard about him, but I didn't know that he got hit into the next morning, and I, yeah, that just hurt me deeply. Meanwhile, the New Orleans advocate is quoting a law enforcement source that claims the two intended targets of the shooting, Arnold Learson and Nathan McRae, are members of 3NG, a notoriously violent that once controlled raid in the neighborhood near 3rd and Galvez in Central City. 19 of its members were convicted and sent to jail in a massive state racketeering case. WWL-TV crime analyst Jeff Asher. It's hard to say whether or not in Central City is part of a larger trend or it's just a single incident with uh, two individuals that were tied. With the mad rush in their minds, neighbors know what a surge in violence could mean for their quality of life. I'm worried about my family. I could have been... Me and my baby could have been walking around that gun to store at that time. And it could have been us. Hungry to retaliate in December of 2016, Jeremiah Lee, aka Zippa, would crush Kareem Dow on St. Andrew Street. It wouldn't be long before the get back would happen. Zippa would be heat up in the 2400 block of South Derby in January of 2017. Warning Maul badly, they would catch him in front of the courthouse. The doors on the minivan that they were driving would fly open. McCoy and T-Red would jump out. Both guns would be on safety and not fire. The female with Maul would flee from the vehicle. Rat would start dumping shots into the whip. T-Red would unjam his strap and join in on the firing. 3 and G would rub the into the face of their rivals by having T-shirts made of the victim. To the surprise of the 39ers, Maul would survive this attack. It wouldn't be long after the attack that both 3NG and the 39ers would be indicted. One day after the WDSU I team broke the story about another sweeping indictment in just over a month, the district attorney and the NOPD are speaking out. Last month, 15 members of the one tenor gang were charged in a racketeering indictment involving guns. Today, similar charges against 20 men with the 3NG gang, also based uptown. Two men are still on the run, however. Kentrell Hickerson and Kevin Lynch. WDSU anchor Rachel Wolf tells us more about the DA's plans and what public defenders is are saying about the case. We will use every weapon in our arsenal to bring them to justice. Orleans Parish District Attorney Leon Canazero was firm as he described a 30-count racketeering indictment against 20 men in the 3NG. He says the group conspired to distribute illegals and used violence to gain and maintain control over the area where it operated near 3rd Street in South Galvez. They don't show any breaks to the people of this community. We're going to give them no breaks either. Authorities say the 3 inch is responsible for at least 10 in the last five years. At the ruthless, reckless, cowardly behavior of these, the people of New Orleans have said enough is enough. This indictment is the fourth indictment stemming from the multi-agent unit. While these cases are more difficult to investigate and prosecute, it allows us to present the whole story to the jury so that they can see the consequences of a pattern of, acti of activity rather than looking at a single crime. Getting these cases to court could prove complex, though, because defendants in each case will be tried together, and every defendant needs their own attorney. Get ready, because the, this, is, this is what we see to be a very successful sort of prosecution. On your side in Orleans Parish, Rachel Wolf, WDSU News. Since it was formed, Canizero says in state court alone, there have been indictments against 35 defendants for 81 different counts and 26. Just when Zippa thought he had gotten away with crushing Kareem, he would be ran down on in front of Jazz Daiquiri shop and be deleted. And tonight about the man police said was the intended target of Saturday's match. Jeremiah Lee was connected to a New Orleans thing. 
And while most of the major players are that now in prison, investigative reporter Mike Pearlstein shows how Lee managed to remain on the street. This man, Jeremiah Lee, was described as the intended target of Saturday night's mass in Claiborne. He also was considered an affiliate of the notorious string known as 3NG. I think the fact that someone decided to show a crowd of 10 people that injured seven and three speaks to what the reality is regarding violence. Lee's rap sheet shows a conviction for in municipal court in 2009, but three subsequent felony cases were still pending when Lee was down. In the first of those arrests in 2010, police say Lee was dealing with this man, Alfred Clay, an admitted member of the sprawling three and eight, named for their connection to the neighborhood around Third and Galvez. Clay is now serving a 15-year prison sentence as a senior member of the... That time includes a five-year sentence for the bust with Lee. But prosecution of Lee has repeatedly been delayed by questions about his mental competency. While that case dragged on, Lee was arrested two more times for distribution of 2012 and for discharging a gun during a family dispute in 2015. Lee was scheduled to appear in court on August 15th in each of those three open cases, but whoever was gunning for him made sure he would not be around to answer to the charges. Police Chief Michael Harrison said the men Saturday were wearing gloves and hoods when they chased Lee into a crowd, first firing indiscriminately, then standing over his body to fire some more. Already serving time for unrelated charges, it wouldn't be until 2021 until Mo will be charged with the crime. The horrific mass back in 2018. 10 people on a busy stretch of South Claiborne Avenue on a Saturday night. Three of those victims. Now, more than three years later, New Orleans police announce an arrest in the case. Mike Pearlstein has the story. That's right, 32-year-old Jamal Smith has been named as one of two men in that record show. He has been in custody since 2019 on separate federal charges. Those federal charges include dealing, being a felon with a firearm, and possession of a firearm while trafficking. His rap sheet also shows prior convictions and prison time for earlier gun convictions. Smith has now been named by the NOPD as a perpetrator in one of the most shocking that take place in the city in the past decade. Three people at night, including the presumed target, 28-year-old Jeremiah Lee, and two innocent bystanders, 27-year-old Taisha Watkins and 38-year-old Kershaw Jackson. Seven others were wounded. Superintendent Sean Ferguson was not available for an interview today, but in a tweet, he wrote, the detectives in that unit are to be commended for their diligence and determination in gathering evidence to charge this individual with this terrible crime. This is another example of how we don't stop until we bring individuals accused of violent acts to justice. Now, I did talk to police about the case, particularly whether they've identified a second suspect. They said that the case is very active and they would release more information as it becomes available. I'm Andy Cunningham outside the district attorney's office where this morning a big announcement related to a multi-agency investigation that led to the indictments of 15 known members here in the city. The police chief says are responsible for at least 15 in New Orleans from 2008 until now, including the Brianna Allen. We'll have much more on this story beginning at 4 o'clock on WDSU News. Tent Ward, New Orleans is the site for America's first development into large-scale public housing, a.k.a. housing projects, historically famous for its garden district and surrounding areas. Minutes away from the 11th Ward, the 10th Ward will be the home of the notorious St. Thomas Projects. The 10th and 11th Wards aren't just all glitz and glamour. They are also home to some of the most notorious street figures in New Orleans history. The multi-agency unit allowed our various agencies to provide full-time manpower to these multi-agency investigations, which are time-consuming and complex. 
This investment in our safety and our future is already paying dividends. Late yesterday afternoon, in this very room, the Orleans Parish Grand Jury returned a 51-count indictment against 15 very criminals. This indictment against the one tenors string is, to my knowledge, the largest and most sweeping state court indictment in the history of New Orleans. The one tenor's name was derived from the 10th and 11th wards of New Orleans. The one tenors would be accused of activity, the illegal possession of and numerous other acts throughout the NO. The one tenors would subsequently be responsible for taking the lives of young Brianna Taylor and Shawana Pierce. Brianna will be hit in front of a house while enjoying a birthday party. Shawana will be blocks away and get hit with a stray. Tyron Harden, Damon Sandifer, and Sam Newman will be convicted at taking the lives of Brianna and Shawana. We have breaking news involving of a five-year-old girl and the mother of three. Emotions ran high this afternoon as a judge imposes sentences in Brianna Allen and Shawana Pierce. Rob Masson is live at Orleans Parish Criminal Court with the latest. And Nancy Mayor Landrieu and Police Chief Michael Harrison appeared in court personally today for today's sentencing. This was a culmination of a major uh, gang enforcement action against members of the one tenor who were involved in a very high profile in Central City three and a half years ago. Uh, the mayor emerged from these steps calling this a sad day for the city of New Orleans, but an important one. That just moments after Judge Tracy Davalier uh, imposed multiple life sentences on Tyron Harden, Sam Newman, and Damon Sandifer for their roles in the 2012 on Simon Bolivar that caused of Brianna Allen and Shawana Pierce, a mother of three. The sentences were imposed in spite of pleas of leniency since two of the defendants were 16 years old at the time of the... We waited three and a half years for this. Um, was it what, 42 months? We waited 42 months and 17 days. This must have we're very pleased with the, uh, with the outcome. It took a while, but yeah, we, we're happy. And today's sentences against members of the 110 were the result of three and a half years of work by the NOPD task force, as well as the Orleans Parish DA's office, which had to put together a fairly complicated racketeering case against these, something that which we hadn't seen too much of around New Orleans uh, here before this case, but something which uh, the mayor and the police chief and the DA believe uh, has helped to curb violence in the city and has helped to curb activity. They say because of today's sentences, the one tenor has virtually ceased operations in the city of New Orleans. From Criminal Court, Rob Masson, Fox 8 News. It is rumored that Tyron Harden will be the first to cooperate. Tyron was arrested a month before the indictments. 15 people will be indicted and accused of crushing 10 or more victims. Damon Lil D. Sandifer will be the first person to be convicted. Lil D. will be heard over a tapped conversation with his older brother Rico Max Newman admitting to crimes that he had committed. Lil Rico would be identified as the leader of the one tenors as he was 23 years of age. Rico Newman would ultimately plead guilty to racketeering, two counts of conspiracy to commit murder and manslaughter. The manslaughter charge would be for the smashing of Keith Berry in January of 2011. Stanton Nan Nan Guillory, who was the getaway driver, in a shooting that claimed the lives of Brianna and Shawana Pierce would also be convicted of crushing Milton Womack in July of 2012. Sandifer would be convicted of crushing Milton David of YMM, Young Melf Mafia. Joshua Pittman and John Jones were the last to be arrested. The nail in the coffin to seal the faith of the two brothers wouldn't come from police investigation. The testimony from the father of Lil D and Lil Rico would seal their fates. Antonio Big Rico Johnson would take to the stand on his two sons. Rico would testify that all of the defendants were indeed part of a street gang, the one tenors, that were beefing with YMM. Antonio would give detailed accounts of what transpired. Big Rico would burst into tears on the stand while testifying and begging his sons to take a plea deal. Bill D. will remain silent as Lil Rico would shake his head in disgust at his father. 
part of Big Rico's plea deal was to take the stand and plead guilty to charges of accessory after the fact to second degree murder, accessory after the fact to attempted second degree murder, and racketeering. Rico would get credit for time served and soon be released. Antonio Big Rico Johnson is now currently walking the streets of the NL. Known as the Big Easy, New Orleans would be nicknamed the Crescent City by coveted author Joseph Hout Ingram in the early 1800s. Celebrated for being the birthplace of jazz, in 1895, the first jazz music would come to life in the N.O. Opened in 1961, Preservation Hall is the oldest standing jazz club in the city. Home of the late Pontchartrain Causeway, the world's longest bridge, and notoriously known for being the capital of the world. Jarrell Jigger Smith was born in 1981 to Lynette Smith of New Orleans, Louisiana. Raised with his father not being in his life, Jarrell would fall victim to the systematic, deep-rooted poverty-inflicted environment that he called home. Jarrell's mother, Lynette, was a street person herself who had been arrested multiple times. Jarrell would be 13 when his mother would be arrested and sentenced for death in possession of that heart. Miss Teresa, Jarrell's grandmother, would raise he and his two sisters in the San Bernard Housing Development, aka the Bernard. In 2002, there were 13 the Bernard. In 2003, there would be 12. Jigger would catch his first jokes in 98. He would be 17 at the time. It is alleged that NOPD surveilled Jigger hustling outside of Mrs. Teresa's apartment. The cops would apprehend Jigger and catch him with a loaded pistol. Jigger would be sentenced to five years on this charge. Jarrell, who stood only five foot six inches tall, was small in stature, but was a giant on the streets. This wouldn't be Jigger's last run in with the law. He would be arrested for other crimes that didn't hold up in court. The year would be 2006. It's the middle of the day in the Hurricane Katrina ravaged neighborhood of the Seven Ward. The stench of Katrina floodwaters were still in the air. It is alleged Jigger and his homies put a kick door on a government-issued Hurricane Katrina trailer. Occupants were forced to lay down while the men ramshacked the trailer. Unaware of what was going on inside, 24-year-old Mandel Tuplessis would show up to the trailer. Jigger would order Mandel to the floor. Unwilling to give up without a fight, Mandel would refuse. It is alleged that Jigger would crush him. The NOPD would later find the trailer. The men had made off with the cash. Jigger would beat multiple cases. Either they were too weak or witnesses were afraid to come forward. No one wanted to take the chance of snitching on a dangerous man who would most likely be sprung in just a few weeks. Jarrell, who had been arrested four different times, would also have over 15 felony arrests on his record. Jigger would beat the charge for crushing Mandel Duplessis in 2006. The crushing of Terry Brock in 2007, the crushing of Spencer Smith Jr. aka Funk in 2003. Jarrell Smith aka Jigger would also be infamously known for taking out the hit on James Taft aka Soldier Slim in 2003. It is alleged that Jigger and SK would be responsible for taking the $10,000 hit on Slim. In August of 2011, NOPD detective will find a familiar face on this latest victim. That face would be Jarrell Smith, AKA Jigger. 29 at the time, Jigger would be found crushed in the 3500 block of Hamburg, just a block away from where he used to live. He would be hit in both his head and chest, the same fate that he allegedly imposed on James Tapp, AKA Soldier Slim. Prosecutors would give up on trying to link Jigger to Slim. Jigger was locked up for crushing Spencer Smith Jr., AKA Funk, who was 28 at the time. Funk, the son of an NOPD officer, would be hit up on December 11th, 2003, while sitting in the pickup truck on St. Bernard Avenue in front of the Bernard. On April 2nd, 2007, Terry Brock, AKA Tuna, would be crushed in front of the Duck All Bar, located on AP2 Road in the Seven Ward. On November 26, 2003, Slim would be slain in front of his mother's home. It is alleged that Jigger and SK out the Bernard were responsible for shooting him four times, three in the face and once in the chest on the front lawn of Miss Linda's crib in Gentilly. December 31st, 2003, Jigger will be arrested in connection with Slim's. The NOPD will find a stolen police issue pistol on Jigger with the serial number scratched off. Ballistics would match bullets from the gun to the ones used to slim. 
SK out the Bernard will meet his fate before Jigger. It is alleged that Jerome Hampton, aka Man Man, would crush AK in the parking lot of a Studio Plus motel located in Houston, Texas, right after Hurricane Katrina. This in retaliation for Slim's. Before his passing, James Tapp, aka Soldier Slim, and Christopher Dorsey, aka B Jizzle, just dropped the hottest mixtapes in the street of the NO. It was on and popping. It's rumored that Slim had several major deals on the table, was about to take the industry by storm, with him being the first artist to drop and Lil Real One being the second. Family is continuing to celebrate their loved one this Thanksgiving, nearly two decades after. On November 26, 2003, James Tapp, also known as Soldier Slim, was shelled right here in New Orleans. In a story you'll see only on WDSU, our Shea O'Connor talked to his family about his legacy. It's two times that I hate, and that's his birthday and this time of the year. I do good all the, re all the rest of the days, but this is kind of hard to deal with. I'm screaming, hollering, let it go. I'm going to a thing, you might see me in the metro. 17 years later, and the mom and sister of James Tapp, also known as Soldier Slim, say it still feels like yesterday when they found out the well-known rapper had been Gentilly. Now for them, Thanksgiving has become a time to remember the legacy he leaves behind. It seemed like every year, it just gets better. People, more people learn about him, more people know about him. And to really be kin to somebody who carries on a legacy and it just gets bigger each year, it's a blessing. They usually spend the day celebrating the life of the New Orleans rapper with family and friends. This year, amid the COVID-19 pandemic, Thanksgiving is different. We have a big family and we can't go be with them like we used to be in with them. So yeah, that make it more tougher for us, especially for me. Soja Slim, a rapper known for his gritty street smart lyrics, is still considered one of the founders of what is New Orleans rap. In 2003, months after Slim would, police arrested Jarrell Smith, a man believed to have been responsible for Slim's. He was later released and never charged. Sometime later, Smith was also. Linda Tapp Porter, Slim's mom, says while no one has been charged with her son, she has found peace over the years. Even though I miss my son, I've been blessed. So I think justice has been done. It's just life and we gotta move on. In the meantime, the mother and daughter say knowing how much of an impact Slim has had on the city of New Orleans, even after, makes every Thanksgiving worth celebrating. That's the best part, seeing the fans and their memories online and them sharing how they really feel about him. And it's like I said, I mean, all these years later, like you said, 17, I mean, and they still love him. To this day, Soldier Slims is still a cold case. No one has been arrested, charged, or convicted. Tropical Depression 12, a swirling band of wind and rain. It picks up moisture and heat, and with them, speed. As its winds reach 39 miles per hour, it becomes a tropical storm and is given a name, Katrina. We shall overcome. A hurricane descends. New Orleans is on the run. August 29, 2005, Hurricane Katrina made landfall 63 miles southeast of New Orleans. New Orleans faces one of the worst storms of the century, Hurricane Katrina. Here, police in Houston, Texas noticed an increase. It came at the same time the city was filling with evacuees from Hurricane Katrina, though police downplayed any connection then. Now, the Houston Police Department says hurricane survivors were at least partly responsible. Ivory Brandon. Harris, a.k.a. Be Stupid, is a well-known street figure from New Orleans. Hailing from the Noya, Be Stupid was a young stepper, bout slinging that iron. Learning from the OG steppers at a young age will make Be Stupid a force to be reckoned with in the mean, grimy streets of New Orleans. As a child, Stupid would run around with empty rifles that were handed down to him by OG steppers. See, it was called the Dooney Boys, but they just thought, for sure, they start calling them the DBs. So you got a bunch of youngs that had came up, up under Dooney, you know what I'm saying? And, and the name of one of them was uh, B Stupid. He in the fed now. That he, me, B Stupid grew up, you know. The, B Stupid grew up on the corner. We we stayed on the same block on Wild Willow, and uh, he was a little young, little wild youngster. My co-defendant Blabber used to go to B Stupid house, 
and, and uh, take the clip out the AK-47 or, or, or the SKS we have and, and, and give it to him and let him run around the house and play with it. B. Stu always was a little young, a little wild or something, so I wasn't shocked when I heard he was out there, you know. As a teen, Stuber would earn his stripes and be recognized as one of the young cutthroat slingers out the know ya. It is rumored that Stupid and Janelle Sanders, a.k.a. Jern, would draw down on each other in the know ya. In 2005, Hurricane Katrina would ravage the city of New Orleans. This would cause everyone in the city to evacuate. We're devastated. We haven't eaten in three days. What turns Katrina into one of the deadliest hurricanes of modern times? No water, no food. We don't have a home. We lost everything. <laughs> Why does it take so long to respond to the cries for help? Who makes the decisions and why? Ivory B. Stupid Harris would settle for Houston as his destination. It is rumored Damn, that the rate would tremendously rise in Houston with the influx of New Orleans evacuees. Sides spiked in September in the following months. The Houston Police Department says a fifth of its involved Katrina evacuees. It would be alleged that Stupid and Madman would take the streets of Houston by storm. Some say trying to avenge of Soldier Slim. Rico Freaky Jackson would take the stand in the Hankton trial and give up information on Madman. All right, what happened? So as he's telling me the story, a guy named Steve from out the Seventh War reached, coming in while he reached for the door at Madman's head. So I started at the door at Madman and he took off running. Okay. But you saw Man Man? Yes. All right. And you said Man Man? Yes. I just called them because they was trying to charge me. So I just called them and I told them what happened. Okay. And when you told them what happened, did you tell them who you saw Steve? Yes. All right. And who did you? Man Man. Okay. Do you know what happened to Man Man? No. Did he go to jail in Texas? I heard he did. Was it good or bad that you made a statement on him? It was bad. Why? Because that's something that we're not supposed to do. The manhunt for stupid will begin. Harris was arrested at 3 a.m. in the morning with the assistance of the Kenner Police Department. Harris was wanted for that happened before Katrina in New Orleans and for Maine Wise in February after the storm. The 20-year-old Harris was a suspect in Houston as well. Houston police called Be Stupid a career criminal wanted in connection with a string of, of Katrina evacuees. Harris was also implicated in a Mardi Gras morning which took place on Constant Street. Stupid pled guilty to manslaughter for the Jermaine Manny Wise who was on Uptown on Fat Tuesday in 2006. Instead of the original second degree charge, the Orleans Parish District Attorney's Office agreed to let Harris admit to manslaughter charges as part of a plea deal that the federal prosecutors hashed out for B. Stupid, who had dodged two prior raps, including a 2004 in the CJP, aka Magnolia Housing Project when he was 16 years of age. 